Ah, Dark Souls. If I remember correctly, what I'm supposed to do is to not die. Easy, mate. That was just my warm up. So Dark Souls, does it suck? Or is it the best thing to slip out of God's bum cheeks since the creation of sliced bread? And Reese's Pieces. But the real question that you should be asking yourself is, do you suck? Yes, you do suck so very much. And by you, I mean me, because my God, I just want to play some Animal Crossing and feel warm and snuggly. But no, now I'm being deep throated by the throat goat Frampt because Dark Souls. Over the years, Dark Souls has been shrouded in the fog and mystique of being one of those really hard and brutal games that only the best of the best gamers can experience with their mastery and study of invincibility frames, pixel perfect reactions, and bleached eyeballs due to staring at the sun for too long. Basically, it's like the heroine of video games, only the cool kids do it. But in reality, Dark Souls is really only a hard game until you realise that you can just walk up behind everything, push it over from behind, and steal its lunch money just like your middle school bully. And that's what's so great about Dark Souls. You can become the bully. Sure, maybe you'll pick up the game for the first time and aimlessly wander around this deliberately vague world that takes extreme pleasure in confusing the hell out of you and seems to purely exist to deliver maximum suffering and stress upon the fleshy, gooey vessels that we call the human brain, which results in you blankly staring into the You Died screen, contemplating every poor life decision you've ever made that's led you right up to this point. Wait, why do I play these games again? Oh yeah, but then it clicks, and you start to learn the enemy's attack patterns and begin to outsmart them. You discover shortcuts that cause this at times labyrinthian structure of a map to loop back into key areas. You find an awesome weapon that you begin to invest upgrades into that results in a swift dispatch of your enemies. I call this one Kevin. You find secrets that reward your curiosity. You become one with the game and start to feel like you're the one that's in control of all of this. And then you make it to the next area and get slapped so hard that you discover what your rectum tastes like. Just very, very greasy. But anus taste testing aside, Dark Souls isn't actually the first ridiculously difficult, deliberately vague, truck stop restroom toilet poo water colour palleted game that FromSoft have created. They've been making people question their very existence since the early 90s, with the likes of the Kingsfield series, The Adventures of Cookie and Cream, and more recently, Demon's Souls. Dark Souls isn't even the first Souls game, with Demon's Souls taking that title a few years earlier in 2009, with it using a lot of the formula and atmosphere created in the Kingsfield series and bringing it to you in HD, so you can see even more clearly just how much you suck. So instead of doing that thing that we seem to be seeing a lot more of these days, known as lazy journalism, and saying that this one thing is like this other notorious thing, where you'll see countless articles calling any game that dares to even stray on the side of not being walking simulator levels of easy, being the dark souls of insert game genre here. We should really be saying it's the demon souls of insert game genre here. Essentially meaning that Dark Souls is the demon souls of Dark Souls, and Demon Souls is the adventures of Cookie and Cream of Demon Souls. Dark Souls takes you, the chosen undead, on an epic story of trials and tribulations through the kingdom of Lordran, where you'll be put to the test against some of the most fearsome foes ever conjured up by a human mind. Like these little mushroom guys. From the fiery, lava-infested depths infested with unspeakable horrors, to grand gargantuan cathedral-esque architecture as far as the eye can see, down into the blackest, bleakest abysses, and the ancient crumbling ruins infested with souls long corrupted and only out for blood. So basically your average British council estate. The Chosen Undead is a silent protagonist, apart from a few grunts and moans once the chains and whips start coming out, to give you the best experience of projecting yourself onto the character and have it be about you and not some pre-made scripted main character with a cliché badass name like Jack Mercer, Alex Carver, or a... Uh, I don't know, Mason Walker. Instead, thanks to the Oblivion-esque character customization, after having the time of my life laughing at the difference between a top-heavy and tiny-head character, I went with Bigham Willem and chose Ryan Reynolds with a bowl cut. I'm pretty sure that you'd have to be some kind of masochist to want to put yourself into the main character's shoes and really feel like you're the one in the story. But to each their own, you big weirdo. 
The pilgrimage sees the chosen undead travel through this ancient world once ruled by an ancient race of fierce dragons as they embark on their journey to recover the lord souls of Nito the first of the dead, the witch of Isoluf, Seif the scaleless, a betrayer of his own kind, and the spread out fragments from the four kings, before finally Gwyn the lord of Cinder. But that's all you know and the game tells you nothing else. Oh, there is this thing about two bells needing to be rung, but uh, I guess you'll have to go and figure that out for yourself. At the beginning of the game, it sort of has a way to push you in the right direction to get going. There's no HUD with a big arrow on it that causes you to spend half of the game looking at this tiny section at the top of the screen instead of, well, you know, the game. There's no GPS that's dead set on sending you the long way around. GTA 4, I'm looking at you. There's no magic sprinkles laying out in front of you, as if a drug addict had just recently ran through here, sharting out clouds of angel dust as he went by. The game kills you… a lot. Until you then find an area where it kills you a little bit less. That's just kinda how you gotta figure these things out if you jump into the game without knowing that much about it. And because of that, during my first playthrough, relatively close to the beginning at a low level, I found myself in this incredibly lovely place full of sunshine, rainbows and unicorns, known as Blight Town. I'd give it 5 stars on TripAdvisor, highly recommended. And as well as its notorious lack of direction, there's also something else that these games are rather notorious for, evil chests. I mean its difficulty and the rather controversial discussion around the want for an easy mode inclusion. And I'm not just talking about get good, although get good. Dark Souls already has an easy mode, it's called just don't get hit dummy. Well, kinda. The way I view Dark Souls is like the way I view a test. You might fail it once, you might fail it twice, but eventually with enough patience, practice and perseverance, you'll probably still die, but you'll more than likely be a little bit closer to winning this time. Unless this is a test for a pilot's license, because uh, if you screw that up, well, I don't think the beef jerkied remains of your body are gonna get up anytime soon for a retry. Not to mention that you can roll to literally become invincible in this game. Like they straight up put an invincibility button in the game and people still complain. But if mastering hand to hand combat isn't your thing, you could always channel your inner MW2 sentry gun and sit in the back corner of the room as a mage until you've got enough kills to call in the tactical nuke. <laughs> Also, the previously mentioned backstabs make a complete mockery out of some of the more intimidating enemies in the game. Take the first Black Knight for example. It's an encounter very early on and he's down the stairs in this little dingy alleyway, hanging out and looking like he could either be in the business of selling cigarettes to kids or in the business of selling kids. And he's very clearly there as a way to tell the player, remember when we put prepare to die in the title? Yeah, that's happening now. Think the first tree sentinel in Elden Ring. But if you do this pro strat, only possible to be mastered after hours of extremely intense training known as walking behind him, you can essentially trivialise the entire fight. And not only does it reward you with this game's mix of currency and XP known as souls, but it also rewards you with a sense of newfound confidence in a world where you just got sat on by this fat dude and ended up inside his sphincter. This game might be brutally hard at times, as I'm convinced Miyazaki bathes in gamer sweat and drinks the blood of Mountain Dew fueled gamers after they punch a hole in their drywall because they've just been ganked by a squad of emaciated fleshy coloured dudes cosplaying as dehydrated raisins. But there is a way to make it through it, you've just gotta figure it out. And when you eventually do, it's a feeling quite unlike anything that I'm yet to discover in another game series. That's or you get impatient and run through the entire area praying to Miyazaki for there to please be a bonfire around the next corner. And speaking of souls, bonfires and Miyazaki's kink for pure and bridled gamer sweat, the souls and bonfires are an essential part of the game for success and progression that you simply just can't go without, is what I would have said before going on to discover people doing level 1 naked runs through the entire game with nothing but their fists and their fleshy parts flapping about in the wind. Thank you for reminding me that I'll never be good enough. There are other ways to give yourself a bit of an easier time, like finding a better weapon, but most weapons will have some kind of stat requirement to use it, causing you to need to pay attention while levelling your character at bonfires. If you want to use this extremely large and girthy looking thing adequately, make sure to check what's required, otherwise you'll be like me in the bedroom, inadequate and forced to use the tiny broken sword. 
Because this is Dark Souls, bonfires can not only be a source of comfort and respite, doing things like de-aggroing all of the enemies, refilling your Estus flasks, this game's healing tool, but also with the required items like the Rite of Kindling and Firekeeper Souls, enabling you to permanently boost your Estus efficiency. The game also does this thing where it respawns the enemies every single time you rest at one. Every time, because Dark Souls. So if you were struggling through an area, and just managed to make it through alive with a sliver of HP left, and wanted to refill all of your healing items, well, good luck, and I hope you invested in stamina, because the enemies were about to invest the sharp ends of their weapons into the puffy fleshy parts of your body. Ow! That hurt! Just whatever you do, don't make the incredibly stupid mistake that I did during my first playthrough. Don't look at the item called Firekeeper Soul and think, Oh, I bet if I use this, I'll get a bunch of souls to spend. You'll get souls from consuming it, sure. As well as a hefty dose of existential dread, as it suddenly sets in that you've just consumed one of a very limited number of items in the game that has the ability to permanently increase your Estus Flask's efficiency. In a game that's constantly killing you. Don't be like me on my first playthrough. Be like ballcutwish.com Ryan Reynolds and swap it out for an Estus Flask upgrade with a Firekeeper. And the game knows what it's doing. Sure, it gives you tidbits of information on the loading screen, that being the only information it'll ever be giving you, because haha, <laughs> Miyazaki. But that time is exclusively reserved for watching videos of people falling over on Twitter, so I'm not sure what you expect from me. The extra dose of HP recovery should see you well as you engage in combat throughout the game, but if you find yourself struggling with a boss or a particular set of enemies, there are always other things that you can do to shift the scales in your favour. Well, well, well. How the turntables... For starters, your weapons can be upgraded to different levels at various different blacksmiths you encounter through the game. Oh hi again Kevin. They can be infused with different special abilities like magic, fire or crystal, but personally I just like to choose raw power, because I just prefer to raw dog my way through life. God I hope my mum doesn't watch this. Items can be found throughout the world or purchased from different vendors, and can be used to either infuse an ability with a weapon for a limited amount of time that an enemy could be particularly weak to, or to apply a buff to bulk up Ryan Reynolds to give you a slight upper hand. Or you know, you could probably just find a way to cheese it. Most enemies have a habit of being able to be easily manipulated, and chances are if you search for it you'll find some weird technique. But if exploiting a glitch or abusing enemy AI isn't exactly your kind of thing, you could abuse the game in an official capacity with summoning, and just pull in an incredibly overpowered, way more experienced player than you that carries you through the boss fight like the weak little injured squirrel that you are. That's me. I'm the squirrel. Well that, and actually one other thing that you could do, the age old tried and tested unbeatable formula. You could, just get good. What I'm trying to get across is that the game does offer a variety of tools to be used at your disposal, it's just down to you to figure out how's best to use them. As mentioned earlier, there is a literal invincibility button in the game. If you perform a dodge roll, you activate something known as invincibility frames, or iframes for short. Iframes are activated through various other actions in the game, but the dodge roll is where you'll really be relying on them. Depending on your equipment load, you'll have a different speed of rolling. There's a fast roll, which at 60 frames per second grants you 26 iframes, the mid roll, which has 22 iframes, and the fat roll, which has 18 iframes. Oh, and there's also a cartwheel roll that has 30 iframes, because sure, why not show off your gymnastic skills as you're being violently torn to shreds for the 90th time? So obviously a lighter equipment load tends to be the more desirable option. Switching out heavier armor sets that can tank more upfront hits but still get stunned, to straight up disassembling every atom in your body and rematerializing on the other side of an attack and taking no punishment for it. And with iframes already being so limited, for the most part you'd actually be better off rolling into an attack despite your natural instincts kicking in and telling you to move away from it. Which often or not results in you taking a hit, as you're then following the very attack that you're trying to avoid. Well, that is unless you've been playing too much Dark Souls 3 or Elden Ring lately, and have become accustomed to the omnidirectional rolling in those games. And due to the limited nature of the four directional rolling in this game, and the lock on camera just sort of doing whatever the hell it wants, you end up flying off in a different direction anyway. Which, while well, yeah, annoying at times, isn't exactly as big of a deal as you'd expect it to be, as pretty much all of the encounters in the game have been designed with four directional rolling in mind anyway. The deeper you delve into the series, the more insane some of the encounters become, where Dark Souls 1 seems to feel far more grounded in comparison. You know, dragons, golems and hellspawn. 
grounded. Though the one thing that is inexcusable is the kick. There's absolutely no excuse for the kick button in this game to be mapped to the forward and the attack button being pressed at the same time. Why yes, of course I wanted to kick this literal god amongst men instead of slapping it with my seven foot weapon. Silly me for thinking otherwise. If you're the type of person who picks up a new video game to escape the unfortunate depression otherwise known as human existence, well Dark Souls might not be the game for you. The brutal, rage-inducing difficulty is well known at this point, but that's not the only emotion that Dark Souls brings out of you. It's an incredibly lonely and depressing feeling world, sparsely populated by anyone not intent on sticking a pointy stick in your liver for your souls, and on the rare occasion you actually happen to stumble on someone who doesn't just kill you on sight for your Jordans, chances are they'll probably just try and kill you later on anyway, because why not? Except for Solaire. Solaire's a pretty cool dude. Oh. You start off in this incredibly lonely and slightly poo-coloured world by waking up from an eternal slumber in a small, damp cell located in the Undead Asylum. A random stranger appears above you and drops you the key to your cell. You make your way out, passing a handful of tortured souls too far gone to even recognise your presence. And that's when you find your first bonfire. Nothing more than a glorified checkpoint at this moment, as any souls you have collected at this point are useless until you make it out of the asylum. But to make it out of the asylum, you're faced with a problem. A big round problem with a dummy thick booty. No, not your mum this time. The Asylum Demon. It's your first introduction to the Dark Souls combat system, where you quickly learn that it's not quite the same as repeatedly smashing the attack button with one hand and eating a bag of Doritos with the other hand until the funny little red line goes bye-bye. You're locked into your attacks once you've committed to them, which means you're forced to stand there completely helpless until the animation has fully finished. So if he decides to crush you with his bootylicious cheeks mid-animation, you've just become a human-sized butt plug. Welcome to Dark Souls. What you're actually supposed to do in this boss fight is to immediately run through another exit and out of the boss room, up to the upper floor, where you're then introduced to the plunge attack that does significantly more damage than a regular attack. But I chose the hand grenades as my starting ability. This is gonna be easy. You then grab your Estus flasks from Oscar, Knight of Astora, the stranger who had previously freed you from your cell, but it appears that he didn't make it much further than that. He'd come to the Undead Asylum in hopes of reaching Lordran to ring the Bells of Awakening, and presumably let everyone free from their cells in the hopes of someone fulfilling that prophecy. And now he's croaked it because he made the foolish decision to not bring a ballistic missile to a sword fight. And for some reason, it now becomes your responsibility. I don't know about that, I'll probably just go home, sounds like a lot of effort. The world that Dark Souls takes place in is plagued by a curse that dooms the afflicted to continuously rise from the grave. At first it doesn't sound so bad, you could probably make some pretty cool jackass episodes out of that, but each time they do rise, they lose a little bit more of their humanity until eventually they go hollow and attack the living. Hence the reason for the Undead Asylum. Build a wall, keep them out. You then hitch a ride from a giant mysterious raven, because that's cool, and the rest is up to you. And by that I mean, have fun dying, because that's something you'll be doing a lot of from here on out. Well, unless you're like me, because I simply refuse to be hit. You arrive at Firelink Shrine, the first bonfire that gives you access to level your stats, and a head absolutely devoid of any information, because we've all been programmed to play video games by staring at the compass or waypoint, and make a beeline straight towards that direction without taking in any of the world. No joke, when Skyrim first came out, I quite literally ran in a straight line towards my objective marker, scaling cliffs and using awkward jumping techniques to climb to areas that I really shouldn't be in. Cause monkey brain go brrr. I wasn't playing the game, the game was playing me. Like my ex-wife. You could talk to this friendly old chap who wouldn't even waste his piss if you were screaming on the floor engulfed in flames, or you could not talk to this woman because she'll just awkwardly ignore you due to her crippling social anxiety. You've got a few directions that you could head in from here, but with the only objective we know of being ring the bell at the top of the tower, you're more than likely going to head up. Unless you, for some reason, decide to go down into the catacombs to be quickly reminded just how much of a miserable failure you really are. Dark Souls may not suck, but the catacombs certainly do. There's two bosses between you and the first tower. The Taurus Demon, an enemy not too different from the Asylum Demon you've already faced, and the pair of Bell Gargoyles. Okay, so I guess three bosses then. 
With the Taurus Demon, you can use the technique previously learnt back at the Asylum by dropping down with a plunging attack, that is if you didn't run in there with handheld tactical nukes to kill and cremate him at the same time. You could fight him normally by studying his attacks and going in for a hit when it's safe, or you could abuse the game like the dirty little scrub that you are and trick the boss into unaliving itself by falling off the bridge. But let's be real, if the game designers didn't want this to happen, then they wouldn't have made a giant gaping hole and given the boss the ability to jump backwards. And that's the thing about Dark Souls. It wants you to succeed, despite how hard it may seem at times. And sometimes, it is hard. Almost as hard as the creepy old guy at the public pool. There are multiple examples of when the game will try to throw you a bone like that from time to time. Like these strange red bloodstains that you might have noticed scattered around the place. Bloodstains that show you a brief little glimpse into another player's failures. It's so you can see what went wrong and attempt to learn something from it. Like, don't jump off this cliff to your certain death high IQ lessons. But you can also find messages left by other players. The messages are limited in what they can say, but undeniably helpful at times. It might say something like, there's a difficult enemy ahead, or there's a secret behind this wall. But as we all know, when it comes to the internet and people having ways to communicate, things tend to take a turn towards maliciousness. Trust me, I was there for the old COD lobbies. And now it becomes apparently obvious why that bloodstain showed someone jumping to their death earlier. If you do make it to the gargoyles and quickly find yourself outmatched, Dark Souls has got another method of helping you get through it. There's this item called Humanity that can be found around the world, and when used at a bonfire, can actually reverse the hollowing effect on your character. So you go from cosplaying as an old saggy ball bag to a freshly shaven perky ball bag. No, this isn't an advertisement for Manscaped. But much like everything in Dark Souls, it also wants to see you viciously murdered. Because when hollowing is reversed, and you have a level of humanity, you put yourself at risk of being invaded by other players and put into PvP. Because apparently there wasn't already enough enemies in this game turning me into a bottom. But the plus side to all of this, if you don't like being a bottom, is that it not only gives you the ability to summon specific NPCs for boss fights, but also other real life players who can flip the elusive and controversial easy mode switch on and carry you through the entire fight. Good Guy Solaire is actually available to be summoned for the gargoyle fight, and he can very much be the difference between you clicking the uninstall button and actually continuing on with the game. Not really understanding Dark Souls when I first played it, that was certainly the case for me. But what you've got to realise about the game is that it's like real life. You get greedy, you die. Except it isn't from heart failure, and more than likely your long ass weapon bouncing off the walls of a tight corridor, leaving you open for the nipple cripple of your life. You head down into one of the most enjoyable areas ever to be put into a game. I'm having so much fun right now. And come face to face with the Chaos Witch Quaylag. Or should I say face to breasts with the Chaos Witch Quaylag? Cause those things are out. I can't tell if it's the lava pool you just shat out, or something else that's causing me to feel all hot and bothered in here. You kill her like some kind of incel virgin, and ring the second bell. A big wave of relief then rushes through your entire body as you feel like you've actually accomplished something, and those previous hours of frustration and wank breaks have all been for something good. And then you realise where you're going next. Sen's Fortress. I don't know who this Sen guy is, but he's a prick. It's like one of those fun houses you might find at a fair, but full of substantially more death and suffering. After you make your way through its maze-like structure, avoiding its many swinging blades and hidden traps, running from or killing the serpent soldiers as you go, you make it to the top to face the Iron Golem, and then immediately die and are forced to run back through the entire thing all over again because you missed the deliberately hidden bonfire at the top. Miyazaki must really like those sweat baths. But after you kill the Iron Giant by either beating it to death or causing it to clumsily fall off the bridge, you're then exposed to one of the most beautiful moments in the game. And I'm not just talking about when the credits fade to black and I can see my reflection in the TV. A group of fleshy coloured naked creatures appear out of nowhere for a cuddle and drag you away to the magnificent city of Anor Londo. Its beauty is a stark contrast to the public restroom toilet poo colours of the game so far, sometimes literally if you go down into the sewers, and you're left feeling like you've made some serious progress. Every single step of the way, you've had nothing but obstacles in front of you. You've fought tooth and nail and defied the odds to get this far. No matter the challenge, every time you get knocked down, you get up fighting. And honestly, you're gonna be fighting again pretty soon. It doesn't get easier. But it is a big milestone, and by now, you should probably be getting a hang of how things operate. The main reason we're here is to obtain the Lord Vessel, an item that upon receiving, will grant us the ability to fast travel between bonfires. But not all of them, because of course it's not going to be that easy. And an item that will grant us the ability to fight for the required Lord Souls. But before you can acquire that, you must face the infamous Ornstein and Smo. So pain. Lots of pain. 
After I defeat the pair, definitely on my first try, I then instantly kill Guinevere, because I ain't no simp, receive the Lord Vessel, and immediately forget to fight Dark Sun Gwendolyn and his weird hentai snake tentacles. I didn't want your stupid soul anyway. It's then time to collect the Lord Souls needed to progress, so I make my way down to the literal depths of hell to beat up a tree, but well, not before playing some Tony Hawk Pro Skater. Take that, environmentalists. Next, it's down to the literal depths of hell, but dark this time, to fight your way through the hordes of emaciated skeletons, otherwise known as the average UK city after the spice epidemic, to fight Nito. After that, it's time for Seif the Scaleless, and if Dark Souls wasn't difficult enough, now they've taken the floors away. The age-old tactic of politely walking behind him and beating him to death seems to do the trick here, and then it's on to the Four Kings. Four continuously spawning enemies that you face in a pitch black void, causing the game to take one look at your depth perception and go, yeah we don't need that. It's essentially just a DPS race to kill each of the kings before another one spawns in, because if they do, have fun running back to that boss room. Once you've obtained all of the Lord Souls, you're now free to go ahead and take on Gwyn, Lord of Cinder. But we're not going to do that. We've got some DLC to beat. Oh god, maybe I am a masochist. First up is the Painted World DLC, accessed by Super Mario 64-ing yourself through a painting, and much like your parents' marriage, was incredibly short. It's a very self-contained and small world, with the only objective being to kill crossbreed Priscilla and leave. Actually, you don't even have to kill her. You can just walk right past her and Sudoku yourself off the ledge and appear back in Anor Londo. I think bowl cut Ryan Reynolds has got some woman issues or something. And talking about issues, Priscilla is a dragon crossbreed, meaning that either her mother or father were into some really weird kinky shit, or I should have really paid more attention in biology class. Either way, don't let them near your bearded dragon. Next is the Artorius of the Abyss DLC. And I know Dark Souls is known for being cryptic and all of that, but come on Miyazaki, how full do you want your gamer sweat bath to be? There's a difference between making something difficult for the player, and flat out not wanting them to even figure it out. To access this DLC, first you need to head down to the Darkroot Basin to dispatch of the Hydra. Pretty easy strat really, just don't get hit. Hug the left wall of this cave that from the shoreline doesn't even look like it goes anywhere. Reload the game for this golem to appear. Kill it, but be sure to not kill the woman it poops out. Talk to said woman. Head back to the Duke's archives where you went to fight Seath. Kill this I'm blue dabba dee dabba die looking ass. Pick up the broken pendant it drops. And then return to where you freed the woman to be greeted by a mysterious looking portal. Where you're then grabbed by a large black tentacle thing that looks like something you'd find on one of those anime booby websites. And now you have the privilege to chat with a talking mushroom. Well done, you beat Dark Souls. And remember, there's no prompt or anything to tell you how to do this. It's not like Fallout New Vegas, where you load up the game, and in the time it takes for all the DLC prompts to appear on screen, you could have learned to code your own game. You have to be smart. You have to use your initiative. You have to Google it. Let's be real, we Googled it. And when it comes to the bosses, the biggest killer can often feel like the run back to the boss and not the boss itself. A perfect example of this for me, Artorius. Sure, he's gonna throw you around the place like that screaming toddler in McDonald's throwing his mum's iPhone because the funny Fortnite dance video won't load. And unlike more recent FromSoft releases, on the way back, you tend to have a moment or two to think about the imminent pain you're about to face the second you walk through that fog gate. And if you're not as dense as a person could possibly be, and for some reason miss the elevator shortcut a few times, by the time you get there, you're not thinking straight, just want it to be over, and die. But what you really need to do is enter each boss room with a clear and level head, study the boss's attack patterns, and figure out when is the best opportunity to slip in for a little light nipple play. And when you eventually do that, you'll die. Yeah, you're gonna die. Artorius of the Abyss is the preferred DLC of mine, although bowl cut Ryan Reynolds would probably beg to differ due to the lack of women to beat up. The Painted World was a really interesting idea that fizzled out just as you thought it was getting going. And while Artorius of the Abyss wasn't exactly long either, it had more going for it. And by more going for it, I mean it had more than the basic bare minimum, one boss. The Sanctuary Guardian that plays into the old fantasy motif of taking a bunch of random animal parts and stapling them together to create something cool. Artorius himself, who's actually incredibly injured when you fight him and nowhere near his full power, so have fun getting beaten up by a dude riddled with broken bones turning himself into a ballistic missile. Manus, father of the Abyss, who as far as I'm aware was really the only boss to take full advantage of delayed attacks, just letting me know how much of a filthy casual I really am. And Calamite the Dragon, one of the most ancient and powerful beings, beaten by a blind dude and some guy with a pokey stick. But after all of that, it's finally time. You've escaped the Undead Asylum, conquered foes ten times as strong as you, descended into the darkest depths, traversed worlds, shifted realities, and broken the very concept of time. It's about to happen. 
After all of that, you must now face Gwyn to kindle the first flame and to ensure the continuation of the world in its state, or let the fire go out and lead humanity blindly into whatever comes next. But either way, Gwyn must fall. You step foot into the arena to be greeted by the sight of a large intimidating man flying towards you with a flaming greatsword in hand, and then you say no and simply brush his sword away with a gentle stroke. Gwyn is no match for your immense power, he stands no chance against bowl cut Ryan Reynolds, he possesses Gwyn's biggest weakness, a shield. Yeah, you can just parry him to death, it's actually kind of underwhelming to be honest. And when you do, the game just kind of ends. There are two endings to the game, but much like the viewer retention of most of the people who clicked on this video, I don't care. And afterwards you can do it all over again, but this time keeping your drip that is absolutely goaded to the max. Each time the game starts again, the difficulty is increased, you keep all of your items except for keys, and all of the bosses and story elements are reset, so you can return to Lordran like the angry stepfather who's had one too many, and slap everything around to feel masculine again. There's a lot of the game that I've skimmed over in this video, like being able to return to the Undead Asylum by cosplaying as an egg, the magic system, which I haven't dabbled in all that much as I prefer to use a blade, I know, how British of me, illusory walls, pyromancy, mini-bosses, and iconic battles like Good Boy Sif, who can only be defeated with the Forbidden Belly Rub, the hardest boss in the game Pinwheel, and the Capra Demon, you'll love that one. That's because no matter how much I explain things from the game to you, nothing will compare to the feeling of actually being a part of it and experiencing it for yourself. It's a hard game at times, sometimes it'll bring you to the verge of recreating the YouTube classic from 2009, greatest freak out ever, original video. <coughs> Basically, I had to suffer, so now so should you. But all of this leads us to the big question, does Dark Souls suck? Well, if it's not your type of game, then yeah, probably. But if you're looking for a challenge that isn't hard for the sake of being hard, a mysterious yet disgusting world that you can't look away from, some of the most rewarding combat ever to be experienced, and cute little mushroom guys, Dark Souls probably won't suck. I can't say that you won't suck, but that's neither here nor there. First of all, I just want to say thank you for making it to the end of the video. I know this isn't my usual thing, but it's been a lot of fun to do. It could be something that I do more of in the future, I've got a few ideas brewing. Second of all, this video isn't sponsored, though it probably should be due to how long it took to make, but me and my fiancé actually run a clothing brand together called Morbid Minds. Obviously by the name it tends to lean more towards the darker themes, so if that's your thing, we'd appreciate you checking that out. We've got some more stuff in the works for it, and are planning a collaboration with an incredibly talented artist who's done some great Dark Souls. Elden Ring Berserk inspired artwork before, so make sure you stay tuned for that. And before we do bring it to a close, I'd like to just give a big shout out to all of my patrons. A big thank you to Dom, Hunters263, Rebecca Pitts, A Dandy in Space, Martin Brannan, Natasha Twyman, Jared C. Bees, Pascal Mathis, Fighting the Pirates, Richard McGowan III, Macy J, Reese Harford, Horatio, Ramey Patterson, Chris, Michelle, Newcomb, Dennis, Wade Knott, Ashley L. Wintz, Christopher Butsky, Joshua Torres, Billy Kyle, Remy, Fire Goes Fast, Josh Brooks, Ash, Dyreem, Robert, Adam, Dark Shiva, and Josh Hannon. So once again, a big thank you to all of the patrons, and thank you to everyone else for watching. 